Joan Dewey and Richard Rorty. And he's become increasingly interested in the ways technology influences the aesthetics of everyday life. So in the paper today, he addresses this. Uh, his title is The Quest for Absolute Sound. So please join me in welcoming to uh, the speaker series, Professor David Hildebrand. Thanks, Rob, and um, thanks everybody for coming. Um, so the talk today is gonna run maybe 35 minutes or so, and there'll be plenty of uh, time for questions. Uh, I put together a, a PowerPoint and um, and hopefully it, it won't be, um, it's not too text heavy and it'll be pretty um, illustrative the so talk. Um, sort of came out of COVID. I had always been interested in music and listening to music and, and and hi-fi to the degree I was sort of interested a little bit. And I think when COVID hit, I really started to, um, you know, we all sort of hunkered down and um, people developed <laughs> different hobbies and different fetishes and, you know, various uh, eating disorders. But uh, the, you know, for me, hi-fi was something which I just started to get into. It was sort of easy to, it was fun. It didn't have anything to do with um, what was going on in the world. And I started to participate in, in uh, audio forums just to learn about things. And what I found by participating in those forums was that a lot of this, a lot of those discussions wound up having different debates about different sort of topics in audio. And I'm going to bring a few of those out. And what I thought those, th those debates seemed to be kind of irresolvable. They sort of went back and forth forever and no quantity of facts could really change the uh, equation in terms of people sort of digging in. And what seemed to be happening to me was that there were philosophical stakes that were laying under the surface of those debates, which really were never made explicit. And, uh, and this isn't surprising to people in philosophy. Often we hear debates happening where the, the philosophical stakes don't get sort of, you know, um, exhumed or unearthed or what have you. So, um, so this paper is really about some of those philosophical debates that lay under the surface of the audiophile enterprise. So just, um, I have a text to read, so I'll read it and, uh, and, and we can, we can break as we go along or we can talk at the end. So most people have met an audiophile, right? They've encountered those sort of weird monolithic speakers. They've seen the glowing amplifiers or they've seen like a viper's nest of cables in the background. And so I think what seems like mere fetishism from the outside actually turns out to be a rather complicated crossroads of acoustics, technological devices, engineering, aesthetic evaluation, consumerism, and psychological listening habits. Audio is all of these things all at once. It's at once an art, a craft, it uh, involves science and technology, and it's a hobby, right, all at once. So you might wonder, well, what is the definition of an audiophile? I mean, everyone's first class in philosophy talks about, well, philosophy means lover of wisdom, right? And so a similar basic definition of audiophile is lover of sound. But I think we can refine that definition just a little bit and probably helpful for some of the other topics that follow. So what is an audiophile? So here are a few definitions of an audiophile. Um, an audiophile, audiophiles looking at the first definition, audiophiles focus on the sound quality of live and recorded music. Audiophiles buy the best gear they can afford and at times actively listen to music without multitasking. And one of the things that I stopped doing sort of during COVID was I started listening to music without doing anything else. And I, I was surprised at how much sort of just occasional or sort of ubiqu ubiquitous listening I was doing. And I, I changed that and I really started to listen in a different way. Um, another definition of an audiophile is someone who listens deeply and appreciates the artistry and the nuance that can be found in a diversity of music. Uh, someone who cares about how things sound uh, and actively configures their experience. So 
that's another good definition. Another one emphasizes, I won't read this whole quote, but someone who has a system where the playback system is forgotten, where you kind of get lost in the music. I think often car audio is like this, right? You don't even think about what you're listening to. It's just sort of all around you. Uh, it sometimes involves a physical rush and sort of just you, it's just you and the music. So I think all of those are pretty good um, helpful approximations at what it means to be an audiophile. So an audiophile is someone who loves music and loves sound and they're deeply invested in both. Now, this is a diverse group, right? Some of these people are seeking transparency, some are seeking transcendence, and some of them I think are just undateable people, right? With a, with a love of, of stuff and gear. So, what happened for me during COVID, I was just, just saying a little bit about, but I really found myself looking for an escape uh, into music, into something which would be different, something which would be diverting. And, and so as I wound up uh, talking and, and learning about the, the subject on audio forums, I put together a good system. And in order to put together a decent audio system, it involved a lot of listening, a lot of auditioning of equipment, a lot of learning about acoustics and the acoustics of my room, even things like what kinds of cables, what kind of electrical power, even, and room acoustics, of course, very, very complicated. So there were a number of things that I started to do in order to sort of optimize the sound that I could experience in my room. And some of those involved, I mean, microphone measuring. You can see there's a sort of measurement microphone in the middle picture there. And then using that measurement microphone, you can do things like you can get waterfall graphs. Those That graph in the top left is uh, helps you realize how much reverberation there is, right? The farther out those um, little mountain peaks come, the more ringing there is in the room. The, the graph down to the bottom left is about the frequency response. So if you've ever been in a, a listen to music and you it was really shrill or made your ears hurt, it was probably very high in the upper end. Or if it sounded kind of muddy or clunky down below, then it would have been sort of, uh, there would have been a sort of a big peak down below. So by measuring your room, you can sort of position yourself, learn where to put things, and you can really find sort of the focal spot for the sound. Um, and what that does is that brings all of the instruments out of the song. Everything that's in the mix starts to be very, very clear and precise. Um, it's, I guess it would be the equivalent of moving from across the room, at, looking at a painting from across the room to moving within a distance where you can really see it and, and start to immerse in it. So these are different fundamentals that I learned. Um, I also learned to write about it, to describe, learn about the vocabulary of audio. Uh, this was something which resulted in me just writing sort of non-philosophy. I wrote a couple of reviews on audio forums, right? These were unpaid amateur reviews and just, just posted them. And then I made a YouTube uh, a review, which involved, you know, some of the, the mad uh, teaching skills that we all gained during uh, COVID and remote teaching. So I, I definitely will admit that a lot of this felt like playing hooky from philosophy, but as I delved into a variety of technical and practical aesthetic questions, like will these speakers work in my room or why do I need a separate amplifier or where should I set up my stereo? As I delved into those practical questions and I got involved in questions and debates on the web, on these forums, I found myself continually drawn back to very distinctly uh, philosophical questions. But the difference here Year was that I was asking these questions of, you know, audio experts, engineers, and hobbyists rather than other philosophers. So I was, you know, you might say that I was embedded, right? I was embedded among a population of non-philosophers asking philosopher philosophical questions. So this raises, I think, a question that's interesting for anybody who's interested in philosophy, which is what can a philosopher learn in discussions that are mostly not philosophical? And what I think became apparent to me is that, that many of the debates draw their energy from philosophical questions which are not made explicit. So what I tried to contribute 
you know, not that successfully because people just don't take to philosophical ways of talking about things. Even if you leave out jargon, there's almost this way in which when you draw people into a sort of a deeper space, there's a kind of pushback or there's just kind of, you know, a, a crickets chirping. Um, but what I found in their debates was that there could be a concept which was ambiguous. There were a set of assumptions about how we perceive or understand music or sound. And so there was this interminable quality to debates which I wanted to try to make more philosophical. So I wondered about how to do that, you know, sort of make that journey down into the cave, if you will. Uh, and I also wondered with the philosopher, Stephen, there are not a lot of philosophers who write about audio or audio file stuff, but Stephen Hale is one of them. And Stephen Hale wondered, um, he asked the question in an article of his, what is it that audiophiles are aiming to achieve with their hobby? What are the aesthetic aims of audiophiles? There has been next to, next Next to zero philosophical investigation into these issues. So Hale wrote that in 2017, and there really has not been a lot of philosophical investigation into these issues. So it's it's kind of exciting to, to research this. And I'd say that I'm, I'm interested in similar questions uh, as Hale. So um, I want to raise a couple of simple questions in this talk. One is, what's philosophical about audio? Um, how do philosophical issues lie underneath the surface? And the second question is, how can it help? How could philosophy help practically uh, some of these technical or hobbyist debates advance by abstracting out towards issues in their more philosophical form? So I think that this investigation into audio and audiophile um, hobby can reflect both back on that subject matter, but also back on the ways that philosophy can navigate back and forth to help enrich uh, both levels. Okay, so there are really three issues that I want to bring up. Um, the there are three audiophile interests, or you could call them debates, and then I'm going to describe the philosophical stakes for each one. The first area is the question of objective measurement versus subjective description. And this is roughly the question of whether reproduced audio should be evaluated with objective measurement or subjective description. The second issue is a question of objects versus environments. Why is audio gear overemphasized uh, as responsible for the sound, despite the fact that the room or the environment is really at least roughly equal in importance? And the third issue is realism versus constructivism. And, and this is a question about what, at what music reproduction should aim. Should it be accuracy? Should it be realism? Or is the goal of reproduced music just to fulfill desires, even if that means kind of constructing the sound? So on with the show. So the first issue we'll take up that I just mentioned is objective measurement and subjective description. Um, so a first very practical question about audio technology is how good is it, right? I mean, no one wants to waste their money. Audio is complicated. And so the question quickly becomes one of how to determine whether a piece of equipment is good at reproducing, uh, reproducing sound. Now, various, when people go researching equipment, there are lots of different experts out there to appeal to. Stereophile is a very reputable magazine. Consumer Reports, many people use that. Uh, the question, though, is still how can good sound be determined, right? On what criteria are determinations of audio quality made? On what should they repose, right? How do we determine it? So the first audiophile debate that comes up, which has philosophical stakes, is how to evaluate audio quality. So audio experts uh, and hobbyists divide here about whether gear and reproduced music should be evaluated using objective measurement or subjective description. So there's a debate in the audio uh, community and it rests on some factual disputes. Now, some claim that physical measuring or objective measurements are adequate to evaluate audio gear quality. Uh, so one example within audio, uh, the, uh, and the other side, of course, is subjective description, right? The, the idea that you really have to listen, experience, maybe write out your reactions to something. So it's sort of the subjective versus the objective versus the subjective. So here's one example of an objectivist uh, about the, the uh, taking that path. Um, so this, this is uh, um, someone who is uh, an, a, 
an acoustician and, and is also involved in selling uh, room uh, treatments. And he says, uh, he argues that everything that audibly affects electronic ear can easily be measured and to a much higher resolution than human ears can hear. There are, he continues, only four parameters needed to define everything that affects the fidelity of audio equipment. Noise, frequency response, frequency response, distortion, and time-based errors. And such measurements, he argues, are more accurate and more reliable than hearing. Now, there are other experts, of course, on the other side who argue just that, that measurements are not enough. So Robert Harley, who is a well-published author and is an editor at various audio magazines and an expert as well, says that the most important indicator of an audio product's worth are subjective experiential elements uh, that objective measurements will never reveal. Audio engineering practice, he argues, has both superficial and real goals, which are too often conflated. Uh, the superficial goal is to provide wide bandwidth, low distortion, high signal to noise ratio, and so forth. In other words, good measurements. But the real goal is to provide an engaging emotional musical experience. And it's a fundamental and tragic error, he says, to mistake the superficial goal for the real goal. Listening is not a rejection of the scientific method. It is an expansion of it. So these, these two uh, sort of camps of experts couldn't sort of be at greater odds. You have these sort of jousting experts, right? On the one side, they're saying measure. On the other side, they're saying listen. And uh, each side of the debate often impugns the methods, the motives, and the self-awareness of the other. I mean, we really sort of have this divide in philosophy. Uh, it's not as clean and as neat as sort of the old continental analytic pe people. I mean, those categorizations uh, of analytic and continental are, are, are really too clumsy uh, labels, I think, to use anymore. But there is sort of an emphasis on exactitude and precision on one side and on feeling and description on the other. So this is it's interesting that this shows up in audio as well. Now, they go back and forth. So you can see, uh, just do a little bit more of this debate and then bring out the philosophical uh, stakes here. Uh, Commenting on the tests which show no quantifiable differences, Weiner says, yet even when a difference can't be measured or defies the laws of physics, some people still insist they can hear an improvement. Beliefs, expectation bias, and the placebo effect are very strong. In other words, he said, if two things measure the same, two pieces of equipment or two speakers, if they measure the same and someone says that they hear a difference, they must be deluded. They must be under the placebo effect, or they're right. They have a, some kind of bias because you can measure everything that we can possibly experience. Um, on the other side, again, you have sort of the hermeneutic uh, repost. And Harley says, right, unlike other endeavors where the result of science is more obvious. Audio, re audio reproduction is different in that the goal of good audio engineering is an intensely personal event that defies analysis by scientific method. This situation in which the result of science cannot be quantified by any scientifically acceptable measure offers an opportunity to explore the relationship between science and human experience. So, it's interesting that this, this is, now this is a debate that's happening that's completely outside of philosophy, but you can probably see how close to the surface philosophy is here. So if we view these issues through sort of a philosophical lens, if we look at the philosophical issues underneath the measurement and description, you see what we really have here is a kind of a contest between realism on the one hand and constructivism on the other, right? Realism is asking, you know, the question, does audio equipment measure what merely already exists, right? And so if it does, and that's what they would contend, then the book of nature is there already, it's fixed in character, and you all you have to do is read it properly, and you'll gain knowledge and mastery, and you'll write reality is found. The constructivist, right, is going to say something like, does audio equipment provide measurements that are prefigured to suit what we already desire? 
right? I mean, we design these tools of measurement. And so if that's right, right, then we're already in sort of transaction with the world of sound, with the world of nature, right? We're measuring by selecting and interpreting and valuing what we already wanted or needed to. And so in this case, reality is in some cooperative sense made. So I'm not suggesting here what which interpretation is correct, but what I am suggesting is that these are philosophical issues which lie pretty close to the surface under the audio debate that I you know, depicted just a moment ago, which are not addressed in, in the terms of that debate. Now there are two further issues involved with this first problem that I think I just want to I just want to bring up quickly. Um, they bear on the phenomenon of the audio experience and on the question of uh, of taste. So one you might say is about audiophile phenomenology, right? Can the experience of audio even be measured with the tools available? Uh, you know, in other words, to, to what degree can physical measurement account for the varieties of ways that such phenomena can be taken up into our experience. Another, um, another element here, right? So that's just, a, just an illustration, right? Can, can we even measure the experience with the tools that we have? Another question sort of related to phenomenology is, you know, what exactly is present to consciousness? And here you might look to something like Mark Johnson's work, um, who wants to think about music. He writes about music in his book, um, uh, Meaning in the Body, and in an article called, article called Music and the Flow of Meaning. He's asked, he says that music, music is experienced not merely as a physical event, but, uh, excuse me, not merely as a mental event, but as a physical and bodily event. And anyone who's listened to music and started to move along with it has realized that, you know, music is, is a deeply affecting thing that is not just, doesn't just stop at the sort of, you know, within the contents of consciousness. Another quick philosophical issue to draw out of this first uh, audio debate has to do with taste. Uh, how well can we measure for taste, right? People have different tastes in, in audio and audio, uh, you know, in different sound as well, right? Some people say, turn the bass up. Some people say, you know, make it louder. So there are all different kinds of audio tastes. And so it raises a question of how well we can measure for taste with audio equipment. This in a way is kind of just an enhancement, I think, of the phenomenological point. Um, and it also asks the degree to which maybe we should reconsider our tastes based on measurement. So there's a role in which measurement can even pl can play in sort of changing our tastes. And if that sounds a little bit counterintuitive, you know, you can just imagine that anyone who ever gets on a, you know, on a scale and to weigh themselves can sort of find themselves second guessing their love of donuts, right? I know that happens sometimes to me. And so measurement can redirect our taste and audio could work this way too, I think, if measurement metrics could be made more relevant to the experience of listening to music. So that I think is sort of a payoff for seeing the philosophical issues uh, underneath um, audio. So I just wanna offer a couple of thoughts and then move to the second uh, audio problem. Um, so I think there are a couple of dualisms at work, sort of maybe at a sort of even deeper level here that are keeping the audiophile debate, first audiophile debate going. I don't think there should be a fundamental cleavage between those who argue for objective measurement and those who argue for subjective description as the best measure of audio quality. I think in, you know, in my view, all descriptions happen for pragmatic reasons. We wanna accomplish something in our experience. We want to have a certain kind of experience and we want to get there regardless of what kind of methods we employ. So these are very old dualisms. They're very sort of familiar to philosophers and philosophy students. And I think that, you know, if folks in an audio uh, read novelists like Robert Piercig or read uh, psychologists like Antonio Damasio or philosophers like John Dewey and Mark Johnson, they would see that there are now that the, the old fashioned analyses into mind versus body, uh, that kind of categorization has outlived its, its usefulness. So I think this is again where where philosophy can help non-philosophy uh, if audio, those in audio were able to accept at least hypothetically that mind and body were not these radically different you know, forces, uh, that we had something more like a body-mind
mind, uh, some kind of like a co-constituting generator of experience, then some of the more fervent antagonisms might be dissolved. Okay, um, let's talk about the second area of um, audio debate. And this has to do with objects and environments. So here the question is whether or not sonic goals, right, the goals of having a certain kind of audio experience rely predominantly on the objects, right, the gear, or on the environment, on the room or on the listener's condition and so forth. And I think within, I can, I can testify to you if you're not involved in these debates that there's a very heavy emphasis placed on gear, on audiophiles on gear, and of course on musicians too. So I have a, you know, I don't know who that dude is, but he's got a lot of guitars. And um, this is what, you know, the late Walter Becker of Steely Dan called uh, gas, uh, gear acquisition syndrome. This is, um, this is basically a question where, you know, Everybody in audio knows that the room is an important element of the sound. And the question then becomes is like, if people know that, why are they, why do they remain fixated on the stuff, on the gear? And, you know, of course that could be, you know, consumerism, it could be a variety of, of psychological elements. Um, but it's, it's definitely the case that, I mean, it's a well-established that the room is a critical part of how, you know, your, your music sounds, whether it's coming from a stereo or whether you're playing a musical instrument, the room is, is super important. So just brief, brief quote on this. Um, uh, again, uh, Ethan Weiner says, you know, acoustic treatment is destined to be the next big thing in the field of audio, but it won't happen unless a lot more people appreciate the importance of their room's acoustic properties. Acoustic treatment is the most important gear you'll ever own. So anyone out there who, who wants to be an audiophile, but who doesn't want to spend a lot of money, um, check out your room. Uh, get to know your room and make it better, and and you will have a, a, a ten times better sounding uh, stereo. So the philosophical issue here, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I want to leave sort of the sociological and psychological factors aside uh, that maybe drive the consumption of you know expensive objects or fancy objects, you know, eye candy and that sort of stuff. But I think that there's um, there's something that happens with audio gear and actually with all technologies that that um, we could look at, um, and this has to do with uh, a line of analysis that you know sort of comes out of Heidegger and then gets to sort of flourishes in Albert Borgman's work, and Borgman called this the device paradigm. Uh, in Borgman's, Borgman's account, you know, in contemporary life, we have a, a whole slew of different devices. They make things easy and their workings are by and large invisible, right? They provide nearly instantaneous, what he calls disburdening. You know, you flip a thermostat and it brings heat, like just like that. You don't have to build a fire. You don't have to chop wood. You don't have to clean away ashes, right? There's, there's an instantaneous production of heat and light. And in this case, it's music. And, and on, this, on this account of sort of device paradigm, what happens is the space of convenience is so personalized, so narrowed, and so, uh, so expedient that everything else sort of in the penumbra of experience is concealed. And this would, in the case of audio, include the acoustic environment. Another issue that could be taken up, and I'm, I'm going to do this very briefly, but I just want to point out it because I was just fascinated to find um, this dissertation on the web, uh, is gender roles. Um, uh, actually, I'll stay with this slide, right? So there's, there's an interesting dissertation entitled Masculinity and Gear Fetishism in Audio Technology Community Discourse. And, uh, and this is, uh, you know, this is, uh, this, this, a, this builds off the fact that the realm of audio technology is predominantly still male. And recent research indicates that this, there's a gender imbalance and that gear fetishism could be in part explained by male hegemony and the perpetuation of gender stereotypes. If you ever wanna have a, if you wanna have a laugh, type into Google, you know, sexy audio ads and look at some of the ads from like the 70s and 80s of 
of gear. I chose like the least provocative one uh, just for the purposes of public consumption. But these were in, you know, these were in standard magazines, right? These weren't in racy magazines, but the um, the affinity between sort of the male libido and gear, the technology, it's, you know, you can see this in car ads still. Uh, and so this, there's an interesting, um, I think, path of inquiry to make uh, between the, this fixation on gear rather than the room and, um, and a kind of, uh, uh, masculine uh, approach or um, uh, a hegemonic approach. Okay, so uh, sort of in the last third of the talk, um, this probably getting pretty close to um, wrapping up. Um, and this is the, has to do with the, this is the third, um, the third area, um, realism versus constructivism. So the last debate to consider, I think, is transdisciplinary, and it, it's, it's, of course, important in painting, it's important in philosophy, and I think we can put the issue with a sort of audio spin in this way. Uh, what should reproduced music sound like? Should music reproduction aim at realism, like naturalness or organicity? Or should it aim at construction, right? Should it just aim to be an interesting interpretation or a sort of a, a intriguing artifice? Uh, how does the goal of transparency relate, right? Uh, there are a lot of people who think that music, a reproduction of music, it should be like a window back to what initially happened, right? This is not really true. We don't do this with painting anymore. Uh, it used to be the case, but, you know, photography fairly destroyed that. But that's still the case with music reproduction, seeing seem that the ideal is a kind of back to the real event kind of transparency, a window to the past. Now, this question of transparency, you know, you can you can go all the way up to the earliest levels of recording, right? There's there is a um, there are realists among audiophiles uh, who are engineers or theorists of different stripes who argue that right the best stereo component is what they call a straight wire with gain, and what this means is that the goal of any component is simply to amplify and convey the music with as little added or taken away as possible. Don't affect the sound, don't distort the sound, don't color the sound, right? No coloration. Up the chain, right, as you go further up from recording to playback, there are mixing and recording engineers, and their job is to neutrally convey the sound and to try to keep their thumbs off the scale. So in this ideal, if everyone is rowing in the same direction, then the outcome should be transparency, right, a clear view back to the performance. And this is the kind of purism that um, musician and conductor Pierre Boulez argued that recordings, in a good recording, one can and ought to hear exactly what was played. Okay. So um, the philosophical expression of this is made by uh, a philosopher named um, Joshua Glasgow in an article called Hi-Fi Aesthetics. And Glasgow says, Look, a recording is transparent just when it sounds like the original performance itself sounded. And he adds that this is just a modest and limited goal, right? And that high fidelity aesthetics is an intuitively plausible position. It holds that a recording can capture what it records without distortion. And so the hi-fi hi ideal for him is to get a perfectly transparent recording. So he calls this a modest goal because um, he, he thinks that we're not trying to get the best or even the most realistic performance in all ways. We're trying to just get as close as possible. So it's sort of asymptotic, but it is asymptotic on something that quote unquote really happened. Okay. Now, again, moving from the realist to the constructivist side, the constructivists are going to see transparency as sort of an impossible or misguided goal. And there are so many factors, they say, that can influence the recording that, an, that the objective has to be just shaping the sounds in such a way that will create an imaginary that is rich, that is varied, and that is sort of immersive enough that the listener will just inhabit it, right? They'll have a connection and an experience with it. So from, from their perspective, constructivism is much more plausible as a position. 
Um, so as, uh, you know, again, the dueling philosopher uh, Andy Hamilton points out, transparency is a very difficult position to maintain. And he says, however one presents the transparency thesis, it faces the obvious challenge that recordings are artifacts. The recorded image, like the photographic image, is always crafted. Okay. Always crafted. Interpretation by the engineer or the producer is inevitable. And, and, you know, set that aside and even listening, right, the, li the, the, the listening end of the chain is also theory laden, right? So this idea that realistic reproduction or fidelity is relative to a playback situation and to a particular set of listener expectations is also part of the construction of the experience. And so it's going to vary a lot. So if a, a philosophical issue sort of at stake in this realist constructivist debate over audio comes back, I think, to uh, fundamental ones involving perception. Uh, I'll just pick two philosophical issues, right? So what happens when we perceive reproduced audio? If we are, are we initially passive, right? If we are initially passive, then transparency is a sensible goal, right? If we're just sort of a blank slate being pinged on by audio sounds, then getting back to that initial source is a reasonable goal. But if Dewey and Mark Johnson are right, are right about how perception works, and many other people take this position too, then music is approached very actively, right? Our interests are already alive. We come to the situation in a way where we're as much taking the music as being imp impinged by it. And so if music is taken and enacted uh, in a bodily way, then on this model, there's no possible correspondence back to some right, originary moment. There's no transparent window possible to some initial right cause. So as Johnson puts this, right, the meaning of music is precisely this dancing kind of embodied meaning. Uh, music does not typically represent anything, even though there may be occasionally some representative elements in a particular musical work. Music's function is instead a presentation and enactment of felt experience. So the organism involved in music, right, on this view is, uh, is the notion that uh, it's an organism involved in art as experience uh, in a dynamic and interactive kind of circuitry. So what's really wished for uh, in a music reproduction then on this view is not the production of some kind of isomorphic simulacrum, but a sympathetic feeling which would work through the recipient. Okay. So now I'm coming just to the conclusion. Um, so meaning is central to human purposes. Right? And how we create, understand, and experience meaning is the province of aesthetics in its wider sense. And both technology and art play profound and interdependent roles in meaning making. So this paper has sought to investigate one more way that we move from the level of everyday life, right, the enjoyment of sound and music, through the technologies which facilitate and shape it, down to the conceptual assumptions and values which await excavation and discussion. So I want to end with a, a short quote from Suzanne Langer, because I think she really expresses beautifully how entangled aesthetic matter and form are. And this may be the most important lesson that technology and art can take away. And here's Langer. She writes, a work of art doesn't point us to a meaning beyond its own presence. What is expressed cannot be grasped apart from the sensuous or poetic form that expresses it. In a work of art, we have the direct presentation of a feeling, not a sign that points to it. So it may very well be that, our, that the medium of our music, right, our technological equipment, is so entangled with the experience of the art form that right, many debates uh, in the audiophile realm might be close to unraveling if it acknowledged that. So that's that's really it. I'm um, That's the talk, and I appreciate you listening. I, I would wonder, I mean, besides whatever questions you have on the substance of the talk, 
I would just wonder sort of empirically, what's the role of technology in the way you listen to music, the way you experience it? Um, what sorts of issues are sort of aroused by the way you listen to music? So that's it. Well, Dave, thanks very much for the talk. That, that was uh, really rich and, and interesting. Um, I, I want to uh, allow people the, the chance to raise questions. And uh, since we're a relatively small group, maybe, uh, you know, maybe you uh, are okay handling uh, questions uh, that come up. Um, and I'm happy to defer, though I do have a question for you. So I'll see if somebody wants to beat me being first. All right then, oh, I'll go ahead. So um, you brought up in the talk, I mean, there, there are lots of really interesting thinkers that you brought into the conversation. And one uh, that I have admired for many years is Albert Borgman and, and uh, you know, his philosophy of technology, Heidegger inspired, but you brought up this uh, issue of the, uh, the device paradigm. And, um, and so I was thinking about this also in connection with you know, some of the debates that you were profiling on the slides. Uh, Borgman, the way I understand it, Borgman wants to uh, see a kind of conflict between the, the device paradigm and focal practices. Mm -hmm. Uh, around which you know we shape our lives, and um, but I, you know the very idea of a focal practice in his sense, like playing a musical instrument or appreciating music, like the the actual practice, the engaged practice of appreciating different um, artists, uh, is uh, something that could you know that we could lose sight of or lose touch with by focusing on gear and uh, devices as a kind of stand-in for the, uh, the lived practices that go into this. So for example, um, it, I mean, it seems to me, just picking up on some of your argument that uh, you know, perception and your enjoyment of music really does involve a kind of interpretive uh, activity and interpretive practice informed by uh, the history of the music that you're appreciating, that the, um, the, uh, the artist um, listening to demos apart from the finished work on an album and, and so on. There's a whole uh, array of practices that go into it that are something quite distinct from uh, s simply focusing uh, on gear and uh, and devices and so on. I don't know. I, that's what came up for me, or, or one thing that I was really interested in, as you were uh, making the talk. Yeah. No. I mean, um, that you know, there's. I I feel like um, Borgman sort of says. Uh, he emphasizes these focal practices and their competition with devices. And, and sometimes he seems to take it back a little bit. Like he talks about how, you know, a really good pair of running sneakers, though they're a technology, they can sort of be incorporated into a focal practice. Um, but yeah, there is this, there is this great danger um, of the sort of the disburdenment going, getting away from us. So we, we never listen to an album anymore. We're just like switching between songs. Um, and and so I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I mean, and actually within, you know, within the audiophile community, there are a lot of people who are big adherents of, of vinyl who think that, you know, listening to records is a way of sort of defeating some of the worst tendencies. Now, I, I, I don't know that that's necessary. I mean, it seems like it would take a certain kind of mental discipline just to put on a CD and let it play from beginning to end. I don't see what's so, or even with a streamer, but it may be that just some of these, um, some of these conveniences are so tempting that it's almost impossible to resist. 
Um, I don't know what, I mean, you and I both grew up listening to entire album sides, right? And I, I don't know, do you think that there is something that's destructive of the focal practice of listening to music that comes from like the, our easy access on our, our phones or whatever, that that's hard to resist? Well, it's, I mean, I think that focusing on, on a certain work kind of apart from the context goes hand in hand with um, sort of commodification of the song. You know, that it, it, it's stripped of other elements that are actually part of the, uh, the interpretation of it. And so now I'm, I'm, I'm sure expressing my own bias about listening to songs in the context of an album, but the songs sound very differently if you take them out of that, con if, you, if you take them out of uh, the, the flow, the, the temporal structure of, of an album, there's something importantly different about it. Yeah. And, uh, Anyway, I'm just, I'm just kind of... It's ironic, too, because, and we should let other people ask questions, but, you know, the Abbey Road side, too, and, and some of the other, other, you know, Thick as a Brick and some of the other albums where they were defeating the single song uh, technology of radio airplay. Uh, and then, so it's, it's like now we're back to single song. But, you know, the whole concept of a rock opera wouldn't exist without that sense of continuity and sequence. Um, Anyway, good, great question. Um, yeah, I, I'm Borgman's, I think, hard for me to parse on this. Uh, yeah, um, I guess we can use the, the hand raise thing. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Julian. Hi there. Um, that was really uh, enjoyable. You raised so many um, really interesting points. And one thing um, that just came to mind, because I just had a conversation coincidentally with someone else about this yesterday, about the, the, uh, the album issue, so from a business perspective, um, you, it's also been argued that most albums um, were just full of filler and that it was a way to basically extort more money out of the consumer um, when the consumer really only wants a few songs and 90% of albums are just really that. They only have a few good songs, right? So I think there's a, there's a point there, a legitimate point there that's, that's separate from what you're arguing just on the business of it and the ethics of the business that in some ways the new system is more ethical because it's less extortive of the uh, of the consumer. But I agree, I agree that you know the album form is is fantastic, and I can think right off the top of my head these amazing masterpieces. I was just listening to one of my favorite XTC albums, Skylarking, which is I think is a fantastic uh, album. You can't really listen to any of those songs separately the way you can uh, through the album, especially the first few. But um, back to what you were talking about. Um, so it seems to me your position then is something like um, Mark Johnson's, right? Uh, the expansive view, what you would call the expansive view. I, I would think, I, I would agree with that, yeah. Okay. Um, and I, as far as answering your question of, of how we, uh, we listen to music now, um, you were talking about preferencing the room and how that's cheaper. I'm not sure that's true. I mean, I, many people now live in, in smaller places and urban environments. And I've had to simplify my, as you know, we've talked about this, my stereo system. I had a much better one before because of the, the type of space that I have living in the city. And so I think that's a legitimate concern too, that people are downsizing in many, many instances um, as uh, people start to live more in urban environments, which is more ecological. And I'm not sure um, focusing on the room is actually any cheaper um, because, you know, that's that could be actually a serious constraint, uh, primary constraint, which which explains why so many of these uh, new systems are, are scaling down. Uh, but but I, I find it's amazing the way the free market and competition and globalization has made um, incredible technology available uh, that we would been we we would have spent three or four times as much for, you know, back when I was younger. Yeah, well, um, 
uh, I mean, the only thing I, I would say about th that issue is that it's it's very very frequently the environment is ignored, and then there's a technological solution for it. So we have a lot of noise pollution, but we don't deal with it. We have noise canceling headphones, right. and, um, and 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 there's a lot of um, or we have an increased amount of headphone listening, and so it's a very different kind of listening. I I'm, I wouldn't knock it, but you can see how you know in in the old days if you had a, you know, if you had a boom box, then other people were somehow participating in what you were listening to. It wasn't every wasn't people weren't sort of isolated. It, they weren't walking around a public space in a private in a private bubble. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't we I don't want to have a technical discussion about the audio about about the room. I, all I would say is that the mere positioning of the speakers and the listening position is free. And, it, and it's an enormous benefit that uh, that people usually, they would probably go shopping for a new receiver at Best Buy before they might just try moving their speakers a couple inches more out from the wall and maybe tilting them in a little bit, uh, maybe hanging up, a, you know, putting down a carpet. There are a number of very inexpensive things to do that will create this incredible uh, focused sound, but um, but what so but for me the in this talk the issue is uh, the issue is why is the tendency always to look for the object or the, you know it's probably market driven um, anyway uh, I'm sure that, it, that it's gender driven that's kind of an interesting way of thinking about it um, but it seems to me that and I'll, I'll finish with this I've got a I've got a meeting at four thirty but uh, that um, we see a, quite a bit of, of behavioral data um, showing that men tend to be much more interested, uh, generally speaking, in objects, right, so-called things, and uh, uh, women more in, in, in persons and in people. And so that may play well play into it as well. Yeah, that's, that's quite possible, sure. Um, well, thanks for the questions. Um, yes, thanks. Thanks. Stick, stick around as long as you can. Deborah? Hi there, can you hear me? Yep. All right, I thought it was a good talk. I have three questions. Um, uh, I, I think the experience, I, you know, I'm old enough and you know that, where I remember you know, the experience of going to Tower Records and going through that line down the middle where everyone's just collectively walking in that line and looping around to find that perfect album, but I also forget nostalgically, you know, what happens when that record, when someone scratches it or leaves it out <laughs> where it's warped. So to, you, so to your question about, you know, what is it like today? I, I, I miss the experience of that, of my youth, but I enjoy the convenience of not having to wait in line only to be disappointed because I didn't have the record or they sold out of that particular album before I got there. So I, I do enjoy the convenience of being able to download it. So one of my questions is about the collective versus individual experience of audiophiles. I mean, do they gather in a room together and you know all listen quietly? Or, you know, or is it much like an experience where it's that talking person in a movie theater? And they're talking it, they're ruining the experience for you. So that's one. Um, two, well, actually, I only have two questions. The other one was, now you have me curious. You did a lot of this during the pandemic. What did you, if you wish to answer, what did you end up with as far as your system? Did you just change things in the room, or did you go out and purchase? Um. So I, I joined the Colorado Audio Society just at the time that COVID shut everything down, right? This is a group with mostly old, old men and, uh, <laughs> you know, first to get the shots, uh, but, but we never, but so the standard thing in, in I, I haven't had a chance to do it. I've only gone and listened to one person's system, but um, would be to get together at various people's house once a month and listen to their system and, and talk about it, um, and, you know, ask questions and sort of, and it's a night, it's almost like a, you know, it's almost like, 
what do they call those progressive dinners where you go from one house to another? And so you get a sense of different people's way of putting together uh, a good audio meal, uh, uh, what they what they think of as good audio cuisine. So I, I've yet to do that. I, you know, the best, the closest I've come is to go and listen to different, you know, kinds of equipment in different audio shops until they like realize that I'm just a tire kicker and they kicked me out. Uh, <laughs> the um, but I think it, I think there's probably the same kind of collective experience that you would get with any group, like with car aficionados or with, you know, people who love any kind of any kind of thing where they're talking about differences and distinctions about what matters, what works, what doesn't. And then they might from that, they might start to sort of peel up to the level of, well, what aesthetic qualities matter and and you know, besides just sort of giving like a, a, a report of, of what they're feeling, they might talk about what, what qualities are important or less important. And so that's an interesting area of debate. As far as the system, I did, um, I did put together a system. So I did wind up purchasing things, uh, but because I'm a um, stingy person, I researched everything and tried to figure out like, well, what would be the absolute best value? So almost everything I got are made by sort of fairly small makers. Um, there's no, you know, there's no big, big brands involved. And, um, and usually you could call the company yourself and talk to them about what they had. And, you know, they'd answer the phone themselves. And, um, you know, wow. usually, so it was really interesting to talk to, it's like talking to the chef, right? Um, except they're, you know, audio makers and, you know, so fairly small companies, like 50 people, 25 people or oh, less. Awesome. Yeah, sometimes even much less, so. Thank you. Sure. Um, let's see. Is that Jeff? Um, yeah. Yes, that's me. Um, thank you for the talk. I'm so sorry. I think I might have been the agent of chaos here. I don't know if I kept bouncing in and out of the meeting and creating that doorbell sound. I'm so sorry if that was uh, if I caused that. No worries. <laughs> Great. Um, so thank you. Um, I, I noticed as we were speaking that um, we all, at least in the questions we've heard so far, we've heard a lot of returns to our own experiences of music as we consider these, uh, these questions that you've brought up. But it seems to me that that's not entirely what's on your plate, that in a way we can, we return to music because that's so close to our own experiences, but from the sense of fidelity and from the sense of just audiophiles, my first question is, do you think that this question is more toward just that, what you were calling kind of the objective creation of sound in the sense that you know, an audiophile may, may take great pride in being able to reproduce the sound of an object falling and striking an object, another metallic object, a soundtrack to a film, perhaps. Those kinds of things are perhaps less musical and more just the, the reproduction of that sound. That, that's my first question. Is that, is that on the table for you? Yeah, and uh, I think it raises a really interesting, uh, you know, subject to, to talk about. Um, uh, if you want to, do you have a second question or do you want to uh, go into that? Well, yeah, I just, the, the, the second question then was then if, well, however that shakes out, um, the aesthetic side of it, which I think you brought out, you know, wonderfully in your talk, um, you know, Kant talks about something uh, like what he calls subjective universality when he says, you know, the kinds of things we appreciate in the music are not the kinds of things that you can isolate as an object or a concept. And yet, we all still sort of treat them with that same kind of objectivity. To put it plainly, when, when you play a beautiful piece of music and someone fails to hear the beauty, then something's wrong with them. Right? Mm -hmm. And we feel that demand on them to hear what we're trying to say. Now, that's the kind of thing, at least from my perspective, that seems to be that the phenomenological stuff you covered and a lot of what we're appealing to from these questions that I've been hearing, that, that seems to me to be purely aesthetic and maybe not so much about a kind of um, a reproduction of an object. Yeah, th those, those are both really great, um, great questions. Uh, I, I have to admit, you know, there is, uh, if you, if you just, if you rig up your system correctly, um, and again, this can happen with lots of different systems. It doesn't have to be necessarily expensive, but if you rig it up correctly, you know, if you, and you have the right recording, right? A lot of recordings are just, they were made for AM radio. They were made to really throw the singer's voice out and just get that tune in your head, right? They want those earworms. They're called earworms, right? That's like the song that you can't forget that, you know, 
my kids always remind me um, of a song that drives me nuts. And then like, I can't get it out of my head. Um, I'm not Let's gonna... play Jethro Toll. Get that, get that album spinning. <laughs> I'll play Ramble on and, and just <laughs> get them, blow them out of the room. Uh, but so, but I will, so I will admit that like, if I play Michael Jackson's Thriller and you can hear someone actually walking across the front of my room, or I have another recording where someone is tinking a glass and it's right there. It's, you can really and there are people who talk about their systems like, you know, oh, on this audio system, you can actually tell the size of the singer's head mm -hmm. and the location of their mouth. So you can get you can get uh, depth and uh, width of uh, what's called soundstage so precise that you're almost having uh, this almost hyper real experience. And on one level that. Uh, it's almost like a Disney, it's like a Disney ride. You know, what you've done is you've created something like a Disney uh, experience. On one level, that's thrilling to me. On another level, I think, why should I care whether I know where Paul is standing or John is standing when they're singing Rain? Because it's such a fantastic tune and the lyrics are good. It's the semantic uh, level and the, the, um, the corporeal impact of the song that really makes it a great song. And why would I wanna get hung up on like the exact placement of the symbol and all that kind of bullshit? So, you know, I think it, you know, this is, it's a hard question. I mean, you all are readers. Um, we all appreciate a nice font. We all get an old book and we like the paper. Um, there's something about those old books that have, they, they bring something to it without necessarily being sort of a Disney ride kind of experience. So I would say that, you know, I, I don't really have an answer, but I, I think a good system should be able to do that. It won't do that for record for most, for many recordings of things that you want to listen to. It will just do a mediocre job at that because of the way it was recorded. And then at that point, you just sort of have to get past that. But um, uh, as far as the con, the, the con point, I think that's really interesting too, because a lot of people will, um, in, in debates about audio, they'll say, oh, these speakers are too bright, they're too loud, they're too boomy, and then people will often retreat into that, well, that's just your subjective opinion, and other people will chime in, and it's like, well, if you can't tell it's a string bass, why would you think it was a good bass sound, you know, it's loud enough for you, it's like eating a cheesecake factory, right, I mean, they've got the, they've got salt, fat, and sugar covered, but they don't have some of, they don't have re really the flavors of things that you want to, so this um, this question of um, subjective universality, I think, does come up. And I think you can I think our hearing is close enough. We, we have similar enough apparatuses in terms of hearing. And we're all in the same roughly in the same culture that we are all raised. We're raised to like and listen for certain kinds of things. I mean, there are obviously big cultural differences among lots of lots of um, people. But you know, we're, we're pretty much fed a very similar diet, at least of, of pop music and music that gets reproduced, that I would say that something like a subjective universality at least derives from it. It's, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't root it in the architecture of the mind, but I would say that it's at least, um, it's culturally encoded pr pretty, um, it's, it's grooved in there pretty deep by culture, not by, right, the apparatus of, of, of the mind's architecture. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Other questions. Um, I have a I have a comment more of. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk. I thank you, David. Um, you. It's so you got me thinking about. So I don't I don't think I have the sensitivity to the sound and music to uh, really engage in that conversation of audiophile. But philosophically, you got me really thinking about what. Uh, what music is and what sound is, right? Like, so there's a, your uh, idea of active perception, right? Um, like perception being uh, in nature active and constructive, right? So um, some sound, uh, right? Some, some might hear it as a music and others might not, right? Like some, uh, if it's not, right? Uh, created as music. So it reminded me of this talk that I heard um, by an uh, ethnologist who is studying um, noise, like no noise level in Taiwan, and how uh, so she came up with this idea of sono sociality. So uh, she 
she calls it sono sociality the like material relations um sound where sound becomes an object of inquiry and like uh sociality between people so she introduced this idea of um noise control uh, placed by the government in the 70s uh how bringing in the technology of like decibel um like and quantifying right the noise and sound completely changed the relationality of the city right so people started developing this idea of um, ownership of space right like so like if they hear fl like toilet flush from the upstairs they would report it like stuff like that so uh -huh. so it's really so it, it was really fascinating to hear that like how sociality can be restructured through sound and noise and um and also like i think sound is racialized as well right so i heard um other research um from a, a, another researcher giving a talk on how um like early 20 centuries like uh, re like record of like Caribbean countries like some people visited and uh, write a lot about I mean in literature actually in literature how, how they write about how loudly people talk right because like people right so there's a racialized uh, aspect as well where some people are perceived to be louder right um, so, I mean, this is not about like music and aesthetics necessarily, but it's sort of like, I don't know if we can call it like politics of sound and, and hearing, right? So there's the constructive aspect of it, definitely what is considered to be uh, pleasant sound versus noise and what is plain noise versus music, like musical sound. You know? Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And, um, you know, this, um, I was trying to push some of this stuff a little further because you know what I what I do in this talk is pretty preliminary. It's like I I bring up some audio debates that people probably haven't heard of, but they're not very complicated. And then I sort of draw this very, it's really pretty thin, you know, it's it's an obvious connection to some philosophical debates that we all kind of know about. But I wanted to push it further. So I I started, I read a book by um, a professor named Lawrence Kramer called The Hum of the World, where he he talks about sort of the, um, it, he really gets into the sort of the, the fine grained nature of listening and and what it means to listen. It's it's kind of a surrender and it's, um, you know, it's almost like what Bergson does about the experience of time. And, and But I was also looking into literature on ubiquitous listening because I find Brian Eno very interesting. And Eno is someone who wants to sort of question this, this uh, division between music and sound and noise. And, um, and so, um, ubiquitous listening is a big topic now in terms of, you know, we all listen to music while we do the dishes, but there's music on in elevators and it occupies a much larger space. And that's why, you know, in some ways, when I tell you that, you know, during COVID, I really sat down and listened with concentration, you all probably nod at that. You probably respect that because you're all philosophers who like focus on books and you, you, you eliminate distractions. And so it's a very sort of old fashioned thing to do is just to sort of focus in on a text, so to speak. But um, a lot of our listening, and in fact, this is what we find in our students, right? A lot of their information comes in from in, at random times from all different directions. And so, I don't know, I feel like ubiquitous listening has something to do with that question of loudness of speech, but also the sociality. So it's part of the social world too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Well, um, let's thank our speaker for treating us to a feast of discourse. Uh, <laughs> so I'm gonna use the, the clapping function. <laughs> Thanks, David, that, that was really great. Thanks uh, all. Yeah, this was, this was an auspicious beginning to the speaker series, and uh, Oran Jiang is going to tell us about our next event in the series. Yeah, so I'll put it put the information in the chat. So we have uh, Dr. Vanessa Wills' um, talk coming up a week from today at the same time at three thirty um, via Zoom. So 
uh, you can email our program assistant for the Zoom link. Um, yeah, so everyone's welcome. Cool. Well, thanks everybody. It was great to talk with you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Right. Bye now.